Possession crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a goal. Oh, there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurland, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. Wow. It's over the bar. Today's RTE GA podcast is looking forward to walking in circles. Oh, hello and welcome to the RTE GA podcast. I am delighted to say I'm joined as always by Rory O'Neill, Sunday Game Series producer, and I would argue two of the finest hurlers in the country, never mind the province of Ulster, Chrissy McCaig and Neil McManus, who are here with us to discuss a story that has really kind of, it's kind of gathered legs in the last week or so. Um, the former down goalkeeper, Graham Clark, did an interview in the Irish News and suggested it's time to to reheat, revisit the Team Ulster suggestion. And it's kind of, you know, both our, our guests today have had a, had, had a speak on it. And, uh, you know, there's curiosity, there's skepticism, there's everything from all sorts. So we're very interested. Just to give a little background here, Antrim would have always been seen, Niels County, as kind of the, at the forefront of Ulster hurling. Currently in Division 2A, but one game away from re- uh, rejoining Division 1. We've down in Derry. Chrissy's Derry in 2B, Donegal, Tyrone and Armagh and Monaghan in 3A and Fermanagh and Cavan in 3B. So that's the situation we find Ulster Hurley in. So first of all, uh, good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. How are we all doing? Good, Mikey. Afternoon, uh, man. Good morning. Uh, afternoon. How are you, lads? So I'll go to both of you. I suppose, Chrissy, first, w- when you saw this story kind of pop up and you probably got a phone call from a few journalists, uh, what, was your, what was your initial reaction? Well, my probably initial reaction was it certainly deserves a conversation. I mean, I was just thinking about things last night and the sad reality is for Ulster Hurling, this story has gained Ulster Hurling more publicity in the last week than it has probably in the last number <laughs> of years, certainly. So it just goes to show you, in my opinion, the little web that Ulster Hurling finds itself in. Um, I've been relatively vocal that if it wasn't for you know, a couple of really strong clubs in North Antrim and Derry and Down. You know, largely Ulster Hurling is, has become extinct. Um, and that's not to say there's not, there's not other clubs around Ulster that are doing terrific work. I mean, I can think of Dungannon and Tyrone. I can think of certain clubs in Donegal. I'm sure there's others. But the reality is the appetite to go and watch the games, the appetite to actually follow the games has become worryingly low. And the reality is you could get on any given Sunday in, in an Antrim or a Derry or a Down more people going to watch a club league game than you would going to watch a Christy Ring semi-final. I know that was certainly the case in the last Christy Ring semi-final I played and, and in a skin there would have been more watching a Slaniel club hurling league game than there was watching a Christy Ring semi-final. I just, you know, I don't see a future in terms of that because... You need some type of incentive. You need some type of publicity to grow the game also. But as players, you want to aspire to play against the best. And at present, you know, arguably, you know, outside Antrim at the minute, um, there's no real pathway for an aspiring young Ulster hurler to play top-level hurling. And that in itself creates a massive problem for me because you ain't going to grow a game if there's no pathway. Mm. What do you make of that, Neil? The, the pathway is, is closed off to Bar, Bar Antrim. Um, and even you would say the pathway, you, it's hard fought to get back onto that pathway in the last couple of years after reaching a particularly low ebb for the county. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, well, I think the point Chrissy makes about the Christy Ring semi final that he played in previously, where the attendance is obviously very low, <clears throat> you know. You look at the likes of Brendan Rogers, along with Chrissy and Shane McGuigan, three exceptional hurlers who are not playing county hurling because county football is much more attractive in there. That's the, the long and the short of it. And what Chrissy's alluded to there previously, um, you know, explains that fully and needs no no further investigation really. But it's I, I think, you know. A rising tide lifts all boats. And I think if Antrim were in Division 1, then, you know, you will have down in Derry saying, look, we know that we're only, you know, a very short distance behind Antrim currently. And we know that gap can be closed. And those counties would then push on, you know, and and make strides. Because, like, 
even even look at Slack Mills uh, last, I'm going to say, seven or eight years. They've been as good as uh, anything in Ulster and better on on, uh, on more than one occasion than anything else in Ulster. So it, it certainly can be done whenever you have uh, a vibrancy uh, and and probably a dedication to it that, that has been exhibited around in many clubs in Ulster. You know, Kiri, an, an incredible club working out of Arma, uh, three, four, five clubs in Antrim uh, continuously for for probably the last century, um, and we we've always been able to hold our own against opposition. And to be honest, the, the, the top four or five clubs in, in Ulster are, are better than you know. Every one of them has a chance at London All Ireland every year. That's that's the long and the short of it. Uh, if you win Ulster, you, you're, you're not too far away. That's the, the long and the short of it. I suppose I feel uh, proved that. And within Antrim, myself, you know, it's a very exciting time for Antrim in the sense that we are on the cusp uh, of possibly rejoining Division 1 again. And whenever that brings you to the level of inviting, you know, Clare, Dublin, Kilkenny to to a venue in North Antrim somewhere, you know, that's that's something that we'd be extremely, extremely excited about. And Chrissy is saying that, you know, that's not the case for, you know, the, the players in Derry and, and Down at the minute. But they would have to be, at a, there'd have to be a, a whole county where they're at a certain level before that becomes something that would be fair to them, you know, to experience as well. You know, they have to build that up as a, as a county. And, uh, you know, come up through the ranks and make those incremental improvements as Antrim have been making over the last three years to be ready. And I genuinely believe I'm ready for Division One Hurling game now. And it took a while uh, to to get there, but I think we're at that point, and hopefully we can win that league final to to make that become a reality. But on yeah. the on the on the, the whole thing, a team Ulster as a whole, my major fear is that what happens to the counties, and even say if it was done without Antrim. What happens to Down if you if you decide that okay uh, Connor Woods, Danny Toner, and the Sands brothers just just to take four of them are now playing for Ulster? You know, playing for Down is a much less uh, attractive prospect now than it was whenever those four players were there. So, you know, the net gain of uh, a small number of each of each county's players getting to operate at Liam McCarthy level, if if that team is capable of operating at that level. Is actually nullified because you know we're actually hurting the counties so so badly on their own. Yeah, and that's an that's an interesting point. Which I'll get to yeah. in a second. Just so to get Rory bring you in here, just your your insight. I suppose for those of us not involved in Ulster hurling, I suppose the conundrum is the fact that you can have hotbeds like Cushendale, like Shotneil, clubs that can put it up to Ballyhale on a yearly basis, but at inter-county level, it struggles to, to become cohesive and would, at provincial level, would that struggle only become greater? I, I, I don't know. I just, it's another conundrum about this. I think, I think Antrim are a peculiar case. I, I was listening to the, the Sambo who was on with Dalo there last week and he was making the point that Antrim are the only county in the six that don't have a border with the free state, so to speak. So they have, an, there's an element of isolation that Antrim have had to um, cope with that the other counties maybe wouldn't necessarily have. And then if you factor in that most of the hurling, if you draw a line from, we'll say, the M50 over to Galway, most of the major hurling is done, we'll say, south of that. That does create a sort of geographical isolation that Antrim have, you know, in terms of challenge matches and trying to maintain a competitive level whereby you can you know, create a sort of an environment where lads can try and compete and bridge gaps. But I, I mean, I come from a county where we have had a long standing history and tradition of divisional teams and people will have their criticisms of them. But the idea behind divisional teams is primarily to give people the chance who wouldn't necessarily have the chance. They might come from a small rural club in West Cork, but they can still play senior championship because they will get that chance with their division. So there's a pathway there. Now, there's all sorts of repercussions. I mean, like you can talk to Donald Cusack. Donald Cusack has two county championship medals. Donald Cusack won those two county championship medals with Emma Killy. He didn't win them with Klein. 
So he wouldn't have that and he wouldn't have had that opportunity earlier on in his career to play a senior club hurling if he didn't have that outlet with the divisional team. So there are benefits. And I think with all of these things, you will always find a hundred reasons not to do something if you look at it. And if it's difficult, especially if it's difficult, you will find reasons not to do it. But it's only until you try it when you will actually find whether or not there are benefits. And look, if you, would, if you did try it and you found logistics, and I know Neil made, makes a very good point around the whole area of logistics and how difficult it would be, the little pocket of hurling in Donegal apparently is up the far end of the county, and how would you organise training? And I accept the point as well in terms of might it have impact upon teams playing with their own counties but i think you'd have to arrange the calendar i mean in such a way that maybe those secondary competitions the lower tier competitions would possibly be run off in advance of the liam mccarthy cup so they can play both and i wouldn't see anything wrong with that so let's say don't go on a run win christy ring there's three or four players have really shone now they've been selected to go and play at a higher level i think that would be very exciting for a player as well to actually say to himself Do you know what I'm now going to go on and contest at Liam McCarthy. That then has a filter effect. Mm. Take, into, take into account, and I think the big one here, is the Dublin colleges system. The Dublin colleges system was originally set up when they were trying to you know, really push hurling in Dublin to compete in Leinster schools. So they won a couple of Leinster championships as a combined, um, as a combined team. Last year, Collage de Own, just down the road from us here, won the Leinster Championship, they beat St. Kieran's College in the final. So that you can't tell me that the combined team wasn't a precursor and a, and a sort of a kickstart and a catalyst for teams then to develop the infrastructure whereby they can eventually stand on their own two feet. But if you don't have a pathway if for a lad in Cavan, for a lad in Monaghan, for a, lad, for a boy or a girl in Tyrone or Armagh, whereby you put a hurley into their hands and you say, if you take this game on, you will get a chance to compete at the highest level. If you don't have that opportunity to offer a child, what's the point? There is no point. I would see it. <clears throat> I'm going to go to Chrissy on this because you, are, you play football and hurling for your club and for your, your county <laughs> where possible. And you, do you think it's realistic in, with what we have in terms of a GA calendar to say that you would throw in perhaps playing for your county in the league or in the Christy Ring or in the Larry Maher or the, you know, whatever county you're from and then go in and play with Team Ulster? Well, I know you're an exceptional case in that you play inter-county football as well, but it would be adding quite a load on. And do you think that would be something that you know, Ulster hurlers would be, would be keen to try at least or to look at? Or is that just an awful lot more games to be trying to cram into an already busy season? There's that many points that we've all made so far. I don't even know where to start. <laughs> yeah. But um, look, I'll start with Neil's points because Neil, Neil forms a very strong argument, to be fair to him. And, you know, I, I think it has to go on the record to say that I don't think Team Ulster will happen. I'm a realist. And I think, I think that has to be talked about. I am just happy that we're having the conversation because at least people are starting to become more privy to the problems that exist in Ulster Ireland, and there are numerous, um, and we can't deny that. When we, when we start to compare strong clubs in Ulster Ireland in comparison to you know, the inter-county scene, I don't think that's a fair comparison either. It's a different conversation. It's a different landscape. And the two... The two entities now have become so far apart, it's maybe worrying in some ways, but that's another discussion for another day. Um, I did mention earlier in the week that um, it can work from the perspective of if Ulster had no, had no teams playing in Liam McCarthy Hornet at present. Um, and that gives you a shop window because the lower tiered Hornet Championships are actually. Um, played off well uh, before the Lee McCarthy competition. Correct. That gives, you, that gives you some type of gateway there. In terms of the logistics, it would be difficult. There's no doubt about that. But when you look at it coldly, I talk to some of the Donegal players and other players in Cork and, you know, and the players living all over the country. There is players traveling significant distances during the week to play. Correct. Anyway. So 
these problems are not kind of problems that would be, you know, only um, exclusive to a Team Ulster concept. But what I would nearly finish the point in saying is that, like, we can talk about underage structures and development plans for years. I mean, I've been privy to this type of conversation going on since I started playing Hurl and Derry and Slaneo. Nothing's really changed but the work of, you know, strong clubs, Cushendall, Lockheed, Dunloy, Slan Neil, Ballycrown, Port of Ferry, Ballygalgate, they're just the Derry and Down clubs, Kevin Lynch's, whatever. Nothing's really changed, in my opinion. And I don't think anything's really going to change unless you give a platform to, for, for a busload of kids from Slan Neil or Cushendall going down to watch Neil McManus play. Against Kilkenny, you know? Kilkenny, Park in August or, or July or whatever it is. That's, to me, what will really elevate the status of Hurling and Ulster. But I understand that comes at a cost. And you, I did say during the week also that you might have to go about it, Team Ulster, at the start. I know I wouldn't play a National League, and you would have to be very careful that it wouldn't clash with the tier or with the teams that each county competes in either, because that would be um, obviously detrimental. <laughs> I just think it's, 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 as Rory has kind of sort of alluded to, it's all too often in, in the GA that we look for we look for reasons why it can't work rather than trying to break the shackles and conditions that haven't helped reduce. Okay. Okay. Um, Neil, um, do you, like, Chris is saying this can't happen because yeah. he doesn't think this will happen. Do you think it could happen without Antrim? Do you think it should happen without Antrim? Uh, you, you, I think you're writing uh, you're, at this stage you and others who have spoken on this are kind of pretty much writing off Antrim in terms of joining this because as you say you're close to the holy grail of Liam McCarthy in Division 1 and that's where you want to be so why would you why would you carry out such a selfless act shall we there's there's, uh, there's there's different ways this, you know for, to think about this I, I really enjoyed I actually loved actually playing uh, the Railway Cup, you know, it was mm. fantastic at that at that stage. You know, especially whenever I was young and I was coming on to a team that had Paul Branagh from Magic Johnson, you know, from Down and Paul McCormick from Armagh. Um, Magic you know, Johnson, I'm, yeah. You know, you, these boys. I've been you know traveling to watch them. My father had been taking me to watch them play against Antrim, and uh, like th th that's brilliant. And it's it's uh, it's a real experience playing with with people from from different counties. It is. Uh, and it, it's it's great, and people think that because Antrim would be so well helped by some of the brilliant players that are outside of Antrim, but yet within Ulster, that you would automatically be challenging Kilkenny and Tipperary and Cork and these teams. There, there's an awful lot of hard work goes into raising standards in the team. There's an awful lot of hard work that would be required for a team Ulster to be successful. They couldn't just, you know, meet up half a dozen times before they entered the All Ireland. There would have to be a huge. This would, it would have to be. People would have to dedicate themselves to Team Ulster in the way that, you know, we dedicate ourselves to Cushendall and Dunham currently. That's the only way that, that that would that would possibly work. Now, I would love, and I, I said this probably all week. I'd love to see a proposal. I'd love, you know, for mm. maybe the GA to give somebody the job of, you know, give us the blueprint. How does this work? And then we would have something tangible to actually investigate and pick the bones of. Um, but at the minute, um, I, like, I want to see Ulster teams, you know, competing at the highest level. That, that is what I want to do. I, I, I'll always remember, you know, uh, Derry giving Offaly a run for their money in, in, in Croke Park. I think it was. I think it was in the year two thousand. Jeffrey McGonagall kind of leading the charge there. You know, that's as as, as kind of vivid a, a Croke Park memory as as I have. Even though I was I was usually going to support Antrim, but there's there's also the the kind of little bit of uh, the little bit of anti Ulster almost in it. When I'm thinking, you know, there's never a word about a Connacht team. You know, Galway are the mm -hmm. only Connacht county playing at the top level, and there's never a word about the, the other Connacht uh, teams. How would we improve them, or how would we give their players a, a chance to play at the top level? There's never a word about it. But as Chrissy said, I, I, the one thing that I am delighted about: people are talking about Ulster hurling now. You know, yeah. and it might not be something that I, I agree with wholeheartedly, but 
I love the fact that we're actually having a discussion that involves something. But, I, 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 but I, and I think it's a positive, though. I mean, and, and also, I do think, like, I mean, again, just not to be constantly bringing it back to a parochial issue, but I suppose the big thing for me would be in the relation in relation to a sort of a county that I suppose would have a long tradition of divisional teams. If like Middleton, for instance, would be competing out of the M.O. Kelly division. But Middleton would be a standalone senior club. So their players don't play with the divisional team, obviously, because they play senior hurling with their club. In the same way that if Antrim managed to get up to Liam McCarthy Cup level on their own two feet, then those players would be ineligible to play for Team Ulster because they would be already competing at that level. And that's absolutely fine. Like, I don't necessarily think that the whole thing rises and falls on the basis of whether Antrim commit or don't commit. I think what probably needs to happen is a serious conversation about, like, like the hurling has been gone. You see, if you look, if you look at the history of hurling, right? The hurling is uh, as a as a sort of an organised game, a hundred and odd years. For most of my lifetime, and certainly like us in the earlier years, there was three teams really: Cork, Kenny, and Tip that bought, more or less dominated the game for a hundred years. And I often hear, "Oh, it's made no progress since." That's absolute hogwash. Like you now have a situation where you have eight, nine, possibly even ten teams that are at a competitive level. This never ever happened before in the whole history of the game. So what's the next steps there is probably to try and get improvements into the likes of Leash, Westmead, Carlo, Kerry. And I think then the next natural step would be to see if you can create something that will help Ulster hurling. And I think this as a concept could be something that people could rally around. I know the proposals, as you say, might be something that you'd have to tease out. Maybe, you know, is it a case that, the, like, again, you're the thing to bear in mind, divisional teams, they don't compete in the league. They don't compete. They Basically, it's a championship-only setup. So you're only playing your four or five round-robin championship matches, which is all run off in the space of a month at this stage. Well, like, this was obviously before the pandemic. So, as I said, like, you'll always find reasons not to do something, you know, if you really look for them. But you won't know unless you try. And I think that's the thing. I think there's an element of, you need it needs to be an element of courage, needs to be an element of bravery. What have we got to lose? Would you know, carry on for in the next hundred years with Ulster hurling going the way it is. Chrissy, uh, I'll go to you first on this. Would this be kind of uh, say the GA did come up with a plan here and say the eight teams did put in a, a in a team Ulster? Would it would it kind of be you know window dressing? Would it be kind of you know plastering over what are the real issues? If the club is the building block of the GAA. And you can list off 10, 12, 15 GA clubs that are doing great work in terms of hurling in the province. But we all know that there are entire counties. You know, Cavan gave up intercounty hurling for a couple of years, though not too long ago. There are vast swathes of the province where Team Ulster isn't going to make any difference. Is it? There are clubs that they're, they're GFC, they're not GAA. You know, we see this. It's unusual. You, you know, you know, you kind of dozed when you see GFC instead of GAA. Like, mm-hmm. it. Is there anything that could be done to to make hurling, in your opinion, a nine county sport in Ulster? Never mind making it a thirty two county sport because that's as Rory just said, is a huge job in itself. Like Team Ulster is not gonna do that festival in the world, is it? No, look, Team Ulster, you know, I've and I've heard people say this and reading the different comments on social media and so on, there has been that argument, you know, but the reality is for me anyway, is at it creates a platform that kids in Cavan and Monaghan can watch mm. players from their province play horn because the reality is, you know, at the minute, kids from Cavan, Monaghan, Donegal, Derry, even Dunk Down, whatever, aren't going to see their county players on TV playing top level horn. So it's a start from that regard. The other side of it is Ulster Horn has, you know, many other uh, barriers geographically. Sambo correctly says, although I'm not too sure if it's just Antrim that are necessarily isolated. I feel quite isolated in Derry playing <laughs> Dublin Club Hurling Challenge and three years on a bus. But look, they are factors, you know, not having access to constantly high level hurling games. I mean, like Neil McManus is cautioned all and ever gonna say, can we go up and play Slanny on a friendly here? Because, you know, we could be we could be possibly meeting each other down the line. You don't want to give too much away in that way. Um, so, like, then automatically your challenge games at a higher level become, you know, even less. So there's other barriers. Geographically, one is a big one, I think. And there just isn't the same number of hurling clubs in Ulster. I mean, you know, 
you you look at the likes of you know Cork. I know it's you know the biggest that has the most number of clubs, but even the likes of you know Limerick, Clare, Galway, whatever, they have a huge <coughs> number of hurling clubs. So naturally, they're going to have more access to a higher caliber of player. So um, I think there's terrific hurlers in Ulster. But I don't think that it works without Antrim because it wouldn't be a fair reflection of it. And secondly, would it do any good for us to Hearn to have a combined team without Antrim playing at Joe McDonough? I believe that would be, in many ways, maybe more detrimental. Okay. What do you make of that, Neil? Yeah, they're all really good points. I, I just, I would love to see the, the blueprint, see what you know, what is actually possible. If if those. If, if the people who are going to be tasked, say, and, it may, and maybe it'll never happen, maybe nobody will be tasked with drawing up a blueprint, but if, if people that were tasked with doing it went and spoke to each of the individual counties and were told that, um, okay, you're going to be able to uh, use June and July to prepare for an All-Ireland quarter final in August, and that's where you will join the, uh, the, the Lane McCarthy at, Maybe, maybe there's a possibility that by that stage, those players are already at a very high level. Okay, they're not getting the whole year to gel together, but they would have, a, have an advantage of coming from, uh, you know, you're picking from many different counties rather than just inside one county. So you, you have a disadvantage and an advantage. So there may be something to look at there. As Chrissy says, it would be great to give Ulster people a spectacle whereby they can, you know, go and watch their own players performing at the very highest level. But unfortunately, this, you know, the truth is this team would be picked almost exclusively from three counties plus one, two, or three players from outside those three counties. That's the truth about it. You know, I'm thinking about Damien Casey. That, you know, would only be, that, would, that, would, that would only be at the beginning. I mean, the hope is that you I don't know. start... I, to, I really you, don't know. You, 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 don't, you don't think so? I, I, I like, I, there's... You know, it's unfortunate that I can think of you know Damien Casey straight away. Like this, I don't think we'll, we'll see this at, uh, in mine or Chrissy's time. Uh, and I, you know, like even you know Declan Culver, a standout performer for Armagh, now done a goal. You know, it won't be during his time. I think that when when the best. The way that Antrim were competitive whenever I was a minor was we travelled continuously, weekend after weekend, to play Wexford, to play Dublin, to play Waterford. We were never off the road. We got a little bit of financial backing to go and do that. And then whenever it came to the All-Ireland quarterfinal, the first year against Limerick, we were right there. We were beat by a point, but we were right there. The next time, we were beat by two points by Galway. Again, we were right there we were with that, with that All-Ireland winning team that Joe Canning spearheaded. It was from being competitive consistently Get, and getting up to that level, the team Ulster wouldn't have that level. You know, if they're going to just be drafted into the championship, you're you're hoping for a one-off kind of lucky performance. Now, I'm so envious. Whenever I look at all the Facebook videos and stuff that are coming up now, like Anton V. Kilkenny in 1991, and uh, again Anton V. Kilkenny in '87 and Dundalk, the crowds are at those games. Mm. They're, they're not at any of the Ulster County games anymore. Even if Antrim had a massive game, and like like the last time we had a you know a massive game or win even was against Dublin and Croke Park in 2010, and there wouldn't have been a quarter of the following as those teams in the early 90s had. So there there is a much larger issue to address, I think, for Ulster hurling, and I think that Team Ulster might give a day out. Uh, I don't know how it would really uh, affect but the grassroots. Not, but would you, but Neil, would you not see? The, like let's just let's picture like kind of like let's play imaginary you know crystal ball stuff here and let's say over the next two to three years the concept was given a trial run on the on a three year basis and let's say at the same time Casement Park was finally redeveloped and it was this fantastic spanking brand new stadium in the in the heart of Belfast right and next thing you had Team Ulster taking on Wexford and you had Lee Chin and Davy Fitz and Matthew Hanlon and Liam Og and all these guys going up to Belfast to take on Team Ulster. In a knockout championship match, I mean, surely that would be a very, very exciting prospect, would it not? It would. Casement alone would would uh, develop interest in, in Ulster hurling. No end. If if Antrim had a home game against 
Wexford saying the National League in it and we had Casement up and going again, you would have the half of West Belfast at it. Never mm. mind uh, anything else. But as I said, like, I, I'd love to see a, a proposal. I genuinely would. I, Obviously, anything that could benefit Ulster Hurling in any way, shape, do, and or form. Do, do you think the will is there at administrative level? Do you think there's a willingness to? Do you think maybe there's you know people are maybe have their reasons? Well, there might be a certain reticence about you know we'll say at county board, sort of Ulster council level. Do you think that they feel that it's just pie in the sky talk, or the you know what what way do you see that? Uh, I don't. I, I I I can't speak for them. I don't know how they view it, but I think, as Chrissy said previously, the the landscape of Ulster Hurling hasn't changed in twenty years. Um, so I I don't. I I would be probably not overly positive about uh, if we just leave it to the powers that be to come up with the the solutions for it. Like it's the strong clubs that are driving the progress. Uh, throughout Ulster um, but those are the same clubs that have been driving it for the last 20 or 30 years so yeah. Ulster Hurling needs a bit of a revolution that's the truth <laughs> I don't I don't think Graeme Clark knows what he started here a couple of weeks ago but um, as I've really enjoyed your contributions on this I, I think anybody listening would appreciate that you're two very, very thoughtful hurlers with the, the best intentions and you know you want the best we're hurling nationally, not just for your own county. I think that came across. And just really, I'll say thanks to both of you for coming on and say thanks to Rory. And um, we'll be back in a moment with the first of our new coaching slots. Oh, holy Moses! Now, since the start of the COVID pandemic, the GEA have had an amazing response to their online coaching seminars, which have now become webinars with over 20,000 coaches from across the country tuning in logging in to get tips on a range of issues that coaches meet in, in GA, whether they're you know coaching under eights or they're intercounty coaches. The array of expert speaking is, is incredible. And I'm delighted to say over the next few weeks, thanks to the GA, we, we're, we're going to have a few conversations with some of these coaches across a range of issues. And this week, as we all really, really look forward to being able to get back on the field, whether we're junior B, Sunday morning, players or we're into county stars we want to get back but there are perils to getting back too quickly so this week i'm delighted to say we're going to look at keeping your squad fit and healthy and preventing injury after such a long time away from the field i'm joined by eamon o'reilly who is the physio with the dublin senior hurlers and a member of the ga medical scientific and welfare committee of kevin feely as kildare senior footballer and athletic therapist and we have sarah lavin a physiotherapist and international hurdler how are we all doing this morning guys Good, thank well, you thanks, for having us. Great. Kevin, I'm going to start with yourself. Can you please explain to us what an athletic therapist is? Yeah, no worries. Uh, athletic therapy, I suppose it's very similar to, um, to physiotherapy, but with, it just it's a course that doesn't delve into as much detail with um, respiratory illnesses and, and neurological illnesses and kind of puts more of a focus on um, musculoskeletal conditions. So um, very similar only that we probably have a little bit more of an emphasis on injuries obtained um in athletic manners and we kind of have a little bit more focus there so it's uh just we don't do any hospital hospital based placements during our college course and um, it's all private practice and then teams and sports based placements but um ultimately very similar to to what most physiotherapists are doing okay um Sarah, you obviously have the you, you have two reasons to be here uh in physio and also an international hurdler who so you've probably have you upped your return to training yourself in recent weeks and what what have you learned having done so? Yeah, so I suppose for me, I've actually never, the training didn't change at any point. Surface changed, um, contact with coach changed. I'm really lucky my coach is actually within two kilometres and same with my training partner, Kira. So we obviously social distance when when that was lifted and we were allowed to meet what last week we were we were able to start going to the park so that's been a real nice kind of breath of fresh air but yeah I think training load hasn't actually adjusted hugely I've been really fortunate AS Fitness the gym which I work out of um gave me a load of my my resistant my gym gear so I haven't had to actually make any alterations which has been amazing that being said I've had a lot of people contacting me <laughs> with aches pains calves just you know what load related injuries because when the country shut down 
a lot of us did one or two things. They went over the top and started exercising every minute mm -hmm. of the day. I had friends who hadn't exercised and now they're running 10Ks daily. <laughs> and then I have, I think the other side of it is probably people who've sat on the couch and are waiting for someone to bring them along, you know, to do the exercise. So I think that is going to be a huge contributor in the coming weeks as to injury. And that's one thing I think coaches really need to tune into. What is that athlete one that overdoes it? Or is that athlete one who's definitely been over, underdoing it? And now we need to gradually bring them back up to speed. Yeah. Uh, Eamon, I would imagine you're in pretty regular w contact with the Dublin Senior Hurlers, or at least the management team are. Are you confident you've got no over or under loaders? Or do you have to accept that that's a, a reality just of human nature? Well, I think, I think if you look at any, any, I suppose, field sport team coming back, you're talking about 30, 35 different individuals coming into that. And you're going to have exactly, you know, what Sarah's saying, you're going to have those guys that have watched Netflix for the last six weeks, taking it easy and basically chilled out. Um, but uh, the more, I suppose, higher you go in terms of the um, uh, competition levels, you're going to see a lot more, you know, focus on their training. And therefore, those guys are less likely, or girls are less likely to have dropped off in that time period. You know, coaches will have touch base a lot of the time with the, with their players, keeping them up to speed. But realistically, there was nothing wrong with teams taking the down period in this time because if you take Kevin there, for instance, he's probably on the go for the last, you know, five, six, seven years with minimal downtime or minimal off season. That's something we always talk about in the GA as being a big issue in terms of players not getting an off season. And essentially, we've had one of the biggest off seasons that most players are ever likely going to have in their careers. So that's that's a big advantage. But you know, coming back into it, looking at the other side of things, it is really all about how we pitch your training coming back in. There. That's absolutely vital. Yeah, we'll get to how you pitch your training in a minute. But I guess we should probably, Kevin, look at what are the risks first of all, and how people might identify what injuries they, they might be at risk of so what what are people coming back to training and who are perhaps pushing it a little bit too hard what are the injuries they're most common to get I'm, I'm assuming kind of soft muscle is the most common thing and are there warning signs they should look out for um yeah yeah muscle injuries are probably what people are going to be at most at risk of at the moment i think even in the when the bundesliga started back up there a couple of weeks ago they had eight muscle injuries in their first uh, first round of matches um almost quadruple what the injury rate was prior to that and it's although it's gone down a bit in the, the next two rounds of matches it's still been uh, an awful lot higher than what it was so you're, you're looking at hamstrings calves um quads those are the, the main kind of muscle injury groups that you will be at risk but also as well tendon injuries from going to to increasing the load too quickly um at too high in intensity are, are probably the the main risk you risk you'll be or what you'll be most at risk of. But um, in terms of managing that, it's just all about how your coaches kind of start you back training. And as long as there's, um, or even I suppose, what they've been programming you to do during this off season. Um, if you've been kind of continually just doing long distance running, endurance based training, um, it's probably not going to prepare you most effectively for the demands of going back to, to full training and matches whenever that does start up, it's just a, a completely different type of uh, stimulus and intensity. So um, gradually kind of exposing your players and your athletes to some kind of um, more match specific type drills, uh, more high intensity running, change of direction stuff. Um, that's probably what needs to be done, like just gradual exposure to that in the weeks leading back to, to matches. Mm. Um, and then on top of that, probably if there's any way that I know it's been difficult with being at home and not having gym equipment available to you, but maintaining some kind of strength training throughout the time that we've had um, without, without team sport would, would make a huge difference in, in trying to reduce that risk of injury when you do go back. Yeah, Sarah, I, I would, when I go back to GA training at the start of the season, I'm, I'm kind of personal, kind of, I run, I run a little, not fast, not very well, but I run, a, I run a little. And when I go back training, I'm one of the guys who's, who's up there first, you know, and actually doing well in like when we're doing our, our runs, you know, not much yeah. a high level footballer, but, you know, I, but then as the season goes on, I'm slowly going to the back because I'm not naturally that fast or that athletic, but, you know, I have that level, I have that base level that I maintain because I just run a little bit. That's obviously a good thing to have. But what Kevin's saying here is your 5k or your 10k run 
that isn't going to, that's not going to prepare different. you for a team trading session at a high level. Exactly. Yeah, because even, I suppose, taking looking at it from a team perspective and a match play situation is unpredictable. You know, there's, there's fast bursts, there's sprints, there's sudden stops, sudden starts, there's rotations, turns. If you've just been doing laps of your local park, or even worse, running down the concrete road and just hammering your, your joints and, and on a surface that you weren't necessarily used to, as mad as it is coming back then off that change of surface back to the grass it's it's just everything's a bit different you know and with the amazing weather we've been having the grass is going to be it's going to be hard you know and that's what, something that I think we really need to consider as well it's going to be very 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 hard surface so you're looking there at just making sure ankles are strong doing that bit of balance dynamic work and um you know just avoiding those ma- those injuries that are just can can be avoidable you know yeah okay Eamon so a squad uh, coach has a squad back for the first time. We will find out on Monday maybe what date that might be. We're, we're still unsure, but they have them back. I guess we're going to do some stretching to begin with. <laughs> like, what, what would you see as a sensible kind of a, approach to that first training session where you want to give lads a blowout, but you don't want anybody to have a blowout? <laughs> yeah, so there's, there's probably a couple of things in that. So we've actually got some... I, um, experience from the past in regards to this. So the NFL had a lockout in 2011, a kind of contractual lockout, and basically there's been some papers done on this and what we were kind of looking at. And Achilles was one of the big things that you know uh, happened at that time point. There was a lot of ruptures of Achilles, a lot with actually younger players, which were normally would be older players, veteran players that would get that type of injury. So if you look at the dynamic here, so these guys are coming back in. As we say, they're looking at 5Ks, 10Ks on the road. So that's obviously a lot more uh, stimulus for the lower limb in terms of calves and Achilles. So if we're bringing them back into multi-directional field sport, so they're going to be more at risk because they haven't been exposed to this. Especially when we look at three to four in a group at the start. So there's obviously going to be that kind of carrot for a coach to work those three, four players a lot harder, you know, in these small groups. And, and if you start going into a load of small sided games straight away that are going to be quite intense by the nature of only being four to five players there, then you're going to end up with a situation where you have a lot of overload of hips and groins. You're exposing the athlete to the risk that we talk about in terms of that Achilles rupture type thing that we would have seen with the NFL. The other big thing that saw with the NFL in that study was people who had previous injuries, so injuries coming into the lockout period, those guys ended up recurring injury-wise. And they don't know whether that was because they didn't have access to gym equipment or they didn't have access to their coaches and, and you know their physios or whatever else, or whether it was just that they didn't have the normal preseason that they have, where they were getting 10 to 14 weeks, they were now only getting 17 days. So therefore, you can't expect a coach to you know, pre-season train an athlete in 17 days for a championship, which is probably what we're looking at here at the start and for most clubs. You know, you can't expect them to have that squeezed in to 17 days of the team training on the 20th of July. Therefore, it probably makes sense that you're starting to bring your um, periodization back to now. So starting off with your running maybe, starting multi-directional and straight line at the start on grass as we discussed because we know there's going to be that uh, contrast from grass to concrete and then looking at some maybe wide ball drills or something like that that might be a larger space that we're not exposing the forces through the hip and through the groin that's really going to affect the athletes and you know I suppose commonly overloaded areas as much but and again the obvious one then is obviously the time the first week you know, you might be at 50, 60 percent of the time that you would expect normally expect. Okay, that's interesting. So you, you're kind of saying, realistically, lads, ladies need to be getting out and doing a little bit. I'd kind of be thinking, even if it's individually, be almost like kind of treating their training now instead of going for that 5K, start doing those little drills, go down to the park or go down to the green area in the housing estate, and almost kind of doing little drills if even if it's individually and maybe tr- already try and kind of kind of pivot their training towards what they will expect to have on the 20th of July 
I think that, yeah, exactly right. So your transition has to be linear. You know, you've got to make sure that you're not going with these big jumps because the peaks and troughs type of approach is going to lead to undertraining or overtraining. And again, there's some great research out there that tells us that if you're undertraining players or if you're overtraining players, you're increasing their likelihood of uh, injury. So, you know, it's really going to come down to coaches and their planning. And, and I suppose using the expertise that they may have around the club that would be aware of how to increase training load. You know, like all, all the guys here on this call will know, you know, what training load looks like and how to measure it. Whereas, you know, some coaches may need a bit of help with that. And it is probably worth getting that help, especially at this time period, because essentially you're going to come to week seven or eight which is probably all we're going to have here from now to start a championship please god then you're going to have a situation where you know if you lose a player in the next three four weeks you're losing that player for a championship and we all know what winning teams do in terms of injuries they're generally pretty low on an injury count and yeah. from that kevin does that resonate with with well i'm sure it resonates with you as a, an athletic therapist does that resonate with you as a killed air footballer have you kind of have you made that transition now from whether it was just you were doing a bit of gym work and a run, have you are you now kind of thinking along the lines of, you know, your your movement training, you know, kind of ball work and just kind of moving back towards what you will expect to be doing on the twentieth of July. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think it, there's almost once you started hearing about um, return dates and the the potential of, of matches in August, you, you nearly kind of start panicking a little bit, thinking, oh God, I need to start ramping up the training. But then if you kind of think about it logically you still as Eamon said you've probably still got eight weeks which is a little bit longer than the majority of pre-seasons are anyway so there's there's still plenty there's plenty of time and there's no need to have a sudden spike uh, in your training load straight away um but in terms of with Kildare you know and I'd imagine it's the case with an awful lot of county teams and an awful lot of club teams as well is that we've been keeping in contact like our coaches have been in regular contact with us since the 13th of March anyway, you know, initially when things were a little bit unsure, we would have been maintaining um, a similar program or as close to a similar program to what we were doing throughout the month of March and throughout the month of April. The month of April. Um, ourselves, we took a downtime in throughout May um, with no kind of prescribed or scheduled training, but um, we're starting to ease back into it now this week. Um, so, you know, we're getting that advice from, from our own strength conditioning coaches and physios and what we need to be doing. but. Um, it's 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 basically along the lines of of what Eamon is talking about. It's just a graded exposure to um, high intensity linear running to change the direction running, and and the the key term there is graded. So we're starting off with a very low volume, um, and we're gradually increasing that as the weeks go by. So we're we're kind of just treating June as an opportunity to get from one point to the next in terms of intensity, um, and that's. That's the common sense approach to this, even even if you're just a club coach without a huge amount of expertise. Um, if you plan ahead and use a bit of common sense, you can you can absolutely plan training sessions so that they're gradually increasing in intensity and volume as, as the weeks go by. And, and it's very doable, even in groups of threes and fours. So, okay. yeah. Uh, Sarah, these, these GA webinars, I believe, are for everybody. As I said, you could be in an under eight, you know, uh, hurling or clothing coach and, you know, you could be a, a junior B or an over 40s coach and you could be taking these seminars and best will in the world. There are plenty of teams out there who don't neither have the organization or the commitment where they're going to be doing kind of the kind of training that Eamon and, and, and Kevin are suggesting there. So let's say they come back to training on 20th of July. Let's pick a team I might play for a junior B football team and that's the first training they're going to do realistically and they have a match in three weeks. They don't have to be as fit as Kevin or the Dublin senior hurlers, but they're still going to be expected to play football or hurling for 60 minutes. And their coaches want them to be, not look or feel exactly like they do on that first day of training. What are some safe, relative, as safe as you can be kind of training sessions or kind of drills or kind of exercises that you can do where you think you are giving them the training load that they need without putting them at harm? Yeah, that's, do you know what? That's the group I'm most vulnerable coming back into this. The high performers have got such a team around them and they're going to be so well monitored and they'll have a huge level of self-monitoring where you're coming out into a more social setting and that's what you really get out of the sport, which is amazing. And I think like, you know, we're, we're very fortunate in this country to have that. Um, they're the group at high risk. I would say, right, okay, in three weeks time, 
what are we trying to achieve or you know why by july july 20th what do you want to achieve definitely you want something sports specific you know there's no point in just heading down and doing the oh this week i did a 5k next week i'll do six and the following week i'll be seven and the next week i'll jump back in because realistically the when a whistle blows for 70 minutes like you don't you don't just all run around the pitch like it's there's absolutely no correlation to that so you need to start be getting right even with hitting against a wall hit um just doing a bit of sports specific stuff doing a few gradually increasing the tempo so don't jump in now and go full max out sprint 90 plus percent because you'll be looking at a lot of hamstrings there that's just one that i've seen and i've even seen sports people reach out to me being like oh i was flying it and uh, i was really working on my speed the last few weeks and then next thing so you know that's definitely something that you really really and even just looking at the is it slightly uphill is it slightly downhill all those things alter your biomechanics slightly so um for them i would say look start even something simple like just get fit quick so you're looking at diagonals or even just 600 meters starting off at like 60 percent gradually 70 80 so that you're when you jump back in you're not jumping in at that 90 plus percent for the first time because often when you get back in with the lads or with the girls you're all like oh i was well some guys will have been doing just biceps for the last three months oh, they, oh, they, you know what i mean there's going to be such a well, they had the weather for it there for a couple and they of had the weather for it, yeah. <laughs> so so you're going to have that you're just going to have a huge range and then there's going to be that like oh i was doing a lot of work with, in the last couple of months and it's going to be that element of of showing off from a lot that who who worked out the best and there'll be if that's the, that's the group i worry about the most to be completely honest with you so yeah just getting getting fit quick and getting that sport specific diagonals are great so you're going that 60 percent across cross pitch or across the park jogging the jogging the shorts and going again doing three laps three laps three laps and just gradually building that's that's just a typical easy well it's not actually it's very aerobic but i mean it's it's got a little bit of change of direction concentrate on form and, and just keep that percent low so you can you can gradually increase it week by week okay that's interesting um, uh, from a hurling perspective what sarah's describing there is great and i'm wondering would you suggest when play like say again let me talk about like say your, your junior b level or whatever like if they do think right okay those diagonals in the park sound like a good idea like should they do that with hurl and slitter in hand? Should they actually try and integrate a few, like, a few pickups, you know, kind of hitting the ball and following it? Like, should you try and bring in the mechanics of hurling while you're doing this? Or should you just focus on the, the aerobic fitness side of it? Yeah, so I'll, I'll say, first of all, I'm a Gaelic football man rather than a hurling man. <laughs> I, if, if I start talking about hurling technique, uh, I'll be getting a lot of guys slagging me <laughs> the next few weeks, so that's number one. Uh, I, I guess there's probably uh, one or two things with that, right? So obviously we've got to get our ball skills up to speed no matter what sport you're playing, get a football or hurling. But there is the physical development side of things that we know we've got you know, really good research to show us that warm-ups such as the GA15 and Activate actually decrease injury risk by up to 50%, okay? So, like, 50% is a huge increase in terms of uh, player availability if you've got 50% lower injuries. And, like, hamstrings, it's even up as far as 64 65%. So, by integrating a specific physical development warm-up such as the GA15, which is readily available on the learning portal, or the uh, Ulster GA is activated, which is the, essentially the same thing. Both of them come off the FIFA 11 plus, which is a soccer type warm up. So yeah. even for these guys coming back, just like for me, I, one of the teams I you know work with is you know one of the teams that in the club here in Ballybone St Enders is you know Junior C or Junior B hurling, and one of the biggest I suppose wins I've had with that with a group of players is by actually bringing in that type of warm up with that group and like the guys were pinging hamstrings left right and center for you know the best part of six months the manager came to me and he said well, what can we do with this and literally by just integrating this into it like we're talking about a lot of older players 30 plus players you know guys <laughs> on the way down rather than on the way up and just by integrating that physical development in and specifically targeting that at the start of every session we were able to make changes positively in terms of player availability and then the second thing i would say is you know getting what we call a nearly like a speed vaccine so uh, speed vaccine what i mean by that is we're getting guys that are actually 
over the maybe not in the first two or three weeks, but over the course of say the end by the end of that third week that you're integrating close to max sprint in you know one two three lengths, not many when you're not fatigued into your training at the end of a warm up. We know we've got research that says that that is also going to help our players. You know, I suppose um, match the demands of game situation because as much as we would like to say you know, they are going to have to sprint when they get on the pitch. And whether you're a junior B guy with, you know, whatever whatever body shape you've got versus, uh, you know, Kevin, you know, or whoever else, you know, those guys are all going to have to maximally, you know, push out in order to win that ball from the from the opposition player. So I, I think by integrating that physical development stuff in, you can make a huge difference in terms of your injury risk then you've got a hell of a lot more time then if you've got the lads in the pitch you've got a hell of a lot more time to develop the ball skills okay we'll finish up now in a minute lads i guess it would just be nice to get each from each of you kind of your, your kind of key tip or the the one thing you think people should bear in mind as they return to training be they a coach or a player just that one thing just that what's the most important thing maybe to bear in mind in terms of their fitness whether it's stretching or whether it's you know keeping an eye on their kind of the workload, et cetera. So just Kevin, I just wonder what would be the one thing that would always be on your mind when somebody's returning to training? Um, yeah, I, I, the one thing on my mind would be just uh, from, from a coach's point of view, it's just, it's all in the planning. Um, so you, you treat this like you would, it, it, like it's January and it's the start of the, the season um, ahead because it's basically, it's a pre-season coming into a very condensed uh, championship. So, um, plan plan for the next eight weeks as you would be planning from January leading into the start of your league campaign. Um, you wouldn't, on your first session back, you wouldn't um, absolutely kill the lads with a, a ridiculous length fitness session. Um, and the temptation, obviously, is, to be, is that you need to be doing that at the moment to get people up to pace, but it's not the... It's not what has to be done. So um, keep your volume and your intensity low to begin with. Try and expose the your players to as much of the demands in a low volume of the game that they, that you can early on. So some low level sprinting initially, some low intensity change of direction drills, and then in your recovery times you can be getting plenty of skills and ball work in between your your running drills as well. Um, and then with each session, you you can look at kind of in, increasing the intensity and volume by ten or twenty percent um, until you kind of gradually get up to to closer to match specific um, training drills. Um, maybe three or four weeks into your preseason, you can start bringing in your small sided games and higher intensity games. But uh, yeah, definitely um, planning ahead is probably the number one tip that I'd be given. Yeah, that seems that would make sense, uh, Sarah yourself. He kind of had a good few there, didn't he? To be honest, <laughs> <laughs> I got lucky. Hey, go first. <laughs> uh, no, I'm messing. But I think for just I suppose this is the individual athlete in me coming out. Mm -hmm. I, as we're progressing now, like unfortunately I'm not on a track surface, and we're hopeful now in the next couple of weeks. But it's just as it's part. It's in the five k, but there was news yesterday, so please God. But for us, it's going to be a huge gradual return onto that hard surface onto the track because we we can't start putting back to back days straight away when the track becomes available to us that really is in control of the team around you is a team as a team player you don't have the exact same amount of attention i suppose you're not as needy as us individual athletes <laughs> but uh you've got that you've got your your main coach the head chef your chartered physio and then for me I've I also so I've John McAvoy's charge physio and Jer Hartman then as as my physical therapist and tuning in the new S&C coach as well that's in there I have you have to check in with them no one can read your mind whether you're a team player whether you're an individual athlete so speak up if you're feeling niggles it's don't be afraid to speak up don't make it look like that's a sign of weakness I think just constantly share in the next couple of weeks if you have an itchy toe if you have an anything share it because you won't be able to go back to back to this time and stuff will appear and it's just catching them early I think that's just communication is my main my main tip. Yeah, no, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. I'd say Eamon's nodding his head thinking you, you'd much rather hear from a player when he has a niggle rather than when he has something torn, really, wouldn't you? <laughs> what, would your, what would your own thoughts be, Eamon? What's the one thing to really keep to the forefront of your mind? Listen, the guys have nailed it there, really. Like, in terms of, um, in terms of playing, going back to play, there's two things. One is, the, one is start with the end in mind. So if you're a coach, 
I, I suppose I'm talking more about field sport athletes, but it probably equates equally to um, you know to individual athletes as well. So whatever your style of play is going to be, you've got to condition the players to be able to uh, undertake that style of play. So if it's a running game, you know, or if it's a you know if it's a short game, whatever it may be, your end goal has to be getting the guys up to that level of training. Now, there's a, another side of things that we've really got to get, get after now, and it probably starts now. It's a bit tricky to do it, but that's the strength side. So we know strength massively equates to injury uh, reduction as well. So by getting guys stronger, you know, whatever way we can do that at the moment, it's going to help the athlete in the long run. And then obviously we're starting to uh, tailor that towards the type of training that we're doing on the pitch and making sure that our training in the gym isn't affecting the training on the pitch um, with regards injuries. If you don't want muscle soreness in the gym, impacting on the pitch-based stuff then as well. So start with the end of mind and work your way back. Like the lads have nailed it really in terms of what they said, in terms of you know, what, what coaches need to do. It's plan, plan, plan. If you've planned really well and you've worked back from there or from what we think is a rough date, then you're going to give the athlete the best chance to be on that pitch, to be on that starting block, on the first um, competitive event that they've got coming back. Okay. As this was a fascinating early morning chat. I wish, I'd, I wish we'd had it before I went for my 5K run. I can just imagine. <laughs> probably done wrong. So I'd say thank you to Kevin, Eamon and Sarah. And just a reminder that there's, um, if you want to have get more information about those coaching webinars, you can get it on the GA website. Uh, that's it for another episode of the RTGA podcast. Thank you very much all for listening or watching us. Please do subscribe to us. Please do. Uh, you know, comment or say nice things about us wherever you're watching or listening. Um, lots more GA um, news and commentary on the RT website and news now app. Sunday Sport and the Sunday Game are both back this weekend, and I believe Saturday Sport is also back too. So that's more sport back on RT as the sporting world slowly wakes up, which is good news. So I'll just say thank you very much for listening, and we'll see you again next week. Goodbye. Possession crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. And there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road. And that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurland, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. It's over the bar.